Momentum is about movement. It's taking a step into godly purpose, investing ourselves into the kingdom, taking the momentary to eternity. It's something to be gained. It's a turning motion to shift, but always shifting forward. It's transforming. Our story is unfolding into a new yet familiar adventure. It's like holding a memento while recognizing the hand of the artist in all the new things in unlikely places. Saying what God's done before will happen again, but it won't look like what we're used to. It's a surprising plan only God could create. It feels like revival. It feels like anticipation. And it looks like His invitation. And we accept. So let us hang on with holy expectation and know that God is calling us to greater things. We just have to say yes. Well, good morning and happy new year. Welcome to 2024. Hope that your new year celebration were amazing or a little boring, or maybe you went to bed early, no matter how you celebrated it. Welcome to this new year. Now, as we dive into 2024, we're just going to pause for a moment, and this is going to be sort of an eclectic moment where three things are all going to come together. This uh, sermon is a vision sermon. This sermon is how do we think about the new year? And also, this conversation is connected to our Acts series. It's all combined together. So, we're going to start in Acts, and then we're going to get actually to 2024, and then how we're going to do well as a church in 2024. I want to start by doing this. I want to remind all of us, all the way back at the beginning of our Acts series, Jesus had just been risen from the dead. He's overcome all the enemies that separate us from the Father, and that's death, of course, and the demonic, and Satan, and, and, and sin. And now he turned 2,000 years ago to people just like us, broken, yet saved people, and he declared to them, and of course has declared to us too, that now we get to walk in the same power that he had for three plus years. And sort of the last grand statement of Jesus that sort of set the stage for our whole year and set the stage for the book of Acts is Acts 1.8. Jesus said this, uh, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit lightens upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. So, if you are with us, you know this, the Holy Spirit was poured out, and then the gospel spread in Jerusalem, starting on Acts chapter 2, and Peter's message, and then it spread to Judea, and then there was this horrific moment where Stephen, who was a deacon, was murdered, uh, actually for just declaring Jesus being who he was. And at that moment, people started running for their lives. And as they were running for their lives, remember we used the illustration of a dandelion? You know, when you pick one and it's sort of a white, it's got that white sort of experience. And if you blow on it, it spreads and it just plants more and more and more. That's what happened. So as these original followers of Jesus were running for their lives, the first place they end up is Samaria, which again is mind-blowing, as we talked about, because the Samaritans were the blood enemy of the Jews, and they were hated by the Jews and avoided by the Jews. And suddenly, the Holy Spirit pours out in Samaria through Philip, and this amazing stuff happens. And then other people just keep running and taking the good news wherever they went. And that's where we arrive at this very important city called Antioch. So you've got to go all the way to chapter 11 to see what happened as people kept running for their lives. Acts 11:19 19 reads like this. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word, that's the gospel of Jesus, only among the Jews. Okay, note that. So at this time in history, 2,000 years ago, there are very large uh, Jewish communities well-established right across the Roman Empire. So what was happening as Jewish people were running for their lives because other Jewish people were hunting them down because they believed in Jesus, they were telling the good news of Jesus synagogue by synagogue. They were saying that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the fulfillment of the Jewish faith. He had lived, he'd done miracles, he died, he physically rose from the dead, and he is the fulfillment, and you need to say yes to him. And this was spreading only among Jewish people. 
And it says they went to Phoenicia, right? And then Cyprus and Antioch. Okay, let me just work this out. Phoenicia is near Mount Carmel. It's 100 miles long, 50 miles wide. It's modern Lebanon today. Cyprus is a beautiful island you can still visit in the Mediterranean today. And Antioch is found today in the southeastern part of modern Turkey. It's still a city. Now, we have to focus in on this one city. And this is going to make a huge difference for everything we're going to talk about today. The history of this city matters to understand what the passage used to mean, what it means to us today. It's going to help us understand how we do 2024 well. And you might be listening to this years later. It still can help you. When Alexander the Great was alive, this city became a hub for Greek administration and Greek culture. So you've got politics, administration, and culture, art, comedy, literature. All right. Alexander the Great dies. His empire split up, and one of his generals named Antiochus, uh, he takes over part of it. His son builds 16 major series, uh, cities. Antioch is sort of built up and then becomes the capital of the Seleucid Empire. Then that falls, and the Romans come along, and then Antioch becomes the center of Roman power in this region. There's about 500,000 people living there. 70,000 of them are Jewish. And, and so here's the modern equivalence. Antioch 2,000 years ago feels like a city of six million today. Um, because again, cities back then were much smaller. I think the largest in the world was a million or a million plus. So this is sort of like living actually very similar to Toronto. It had a thriving economy. It's built at the crossroads where the trade routes between Judea, Egypt, Persia, and Asian Minor all met. It was called Antioch the Great or the Queen of the East. It had Romans and Greeks and Phoenicians and Jews and Arabs and Persians and Egyptians and many more ethnicities all living in the one city. Like I said, by the time the Romans take over, it's considered the third most important city in the whole Roman Empire, just behind Rome and Alexandria. It also, at this point, during the Roman time, had become a key religious center again. It had, it had temples to Zeus and Apollos, uh, 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 Poseidon and uh, Adonis. Five miles from Antioch was another little city, which was famous for worshiping Artemis and Apollos and Astri. And it's, again, I'm not going to go into detail, but it was famous for worshiping those Greek slash Roman deities through sexual acts. So this is what Antioch is known for. Antioch is known for a lot of sexual activity in a lot of different directions. You've got a city that's very pluralistic, multicultural, very political, very sexual. And at this time, just like in Alexander the Great's time, it's famous for art, literature, and actually was very famous for comedy. So this is like living in Toronto or New York or London or, or, or L.A. as an example. Okay. So let me just do this. The good news about Jesus spreads first from Jerusalem, then to Judea, then shockingly to Samaria, then to Phoenicia, then to Cyprus, and then across the Mediterranean to Antioch. Now, everything's still basically within Jewish communities at this point. And then everything changes right here. Verse 20. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Okay, this verse seems like blah, blah, boring history. No, no, it is humongous. You have Jewish people that believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the fulfillment of the Jewish faith. They're from Cyprus and Cyrene. Cyrene, by the way, is Libya, North Africa. And then they go and they begin to do what Peter did back in Acts 10 with that Roman centurion. They start speaking to non-Jews about Jesus and the non-Jewish people, especially the Greeks at this point, start saying, oh, yes, we also want to be followers of Jesus. Now, we just need to pause. This is a huge pause moment as we get going in 2024. If you're a long-term Christian, a brand new Christian, or you're checking the faith out, you're from another faith, this matters. Before we go any farther, we need to stop and begin to ask the question or hear this answered again. What are they sharing? The word gospel or good news is such a churchy word. You can read it so quickly and go, yeah, 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 yeah. But if you don't get what the message is, then actually you can get in trouble. The best summary of what they were sharing, we talked about back in Acts 2. If you want to know what the Christian message, the gospel, the good news is, here it is. Ready? Jesus really lived. Jesus sums up the Old Testament. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Jewish faith. Jesus was a real man whose life was marked by miracles. 
Jesus was actually crucified. Jesus actually died. It was God the Father's plan to do this all along. Three days later, Jesus physically rose from the dead. Jesus is king. Jesus is reigning right now. All of us as human beings are in sin. All of us are corrupt. Even the most religious people of any stripe on earth are actually guilty of sin. All of us, secular, spiritual, and religious, need a savior. Uh, Jesus is not just a prophet or man alone. He's God in flesh. If you accept Jesus, who he is and what he's accomplished, you get the greatest gift, the Holy Spirit, you get forgiven of your sins. You can, you can join God's real movement, no matter your history or background. And just like Jesus was raised from the dead, you will be raised from the dead. God is holy. God is love. God is not silent. God has reached out. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We do not shrink back from the resurrection. Jesus is coming back from the dead as the place of validation for our movement. We believe in exclusive claims of truth. Yes, we live in a postmodern pluralistic age that teaches us truth is subjective, or many people believe truth can only be found maybe in science, but nothing else, or truth is only discovered through experience, and it's truth only for a time. But the Christian gospel says, no, will not skirt around the issue of sin or spiritual corruption. Peter's message is that we all know something's wrong with us as humans, but the feeling of something being off is not enough. We're guilty. We have to repent. We as Christians are pessimistic about human nature, but we are excited, blown away, hopeful and joyful because of the love of grace of God, who by the Holy Spirit can transform us from the inside out because of Jesus. He can make the most hostile, barren, desert-like conditions bloom. That is what Peter preached, and that's what these men were sharing in Antioch. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Miracles is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, justice is not the gospel. Their outworkings are evidence, but they are not the gospel. This is the gospel. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. Okay, let me read this again. Verse 20. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also. This is really powerful. We don't know who they are. They're unnamed people. We don't even know if they were leaders. And they, <laughs> this is brilliant, they establish one of the most significant churches in history, which, by the way, is still running today. Okay, keep that in your head as we get near the end. Well, it says in verse 21, the Lord's hand was with them. A great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Okay, again, you could read this verse so quickly and miss the power of it. The Lord's hand is a very significant Old Testament phrase, and it was only used for God himself. So in the time of Moses, in the time of Joshua, in the time of Elisha, in the time of Ezra, it was used for God working in powerful ways. But now this phrase is being used for Jesus. This is pointing us again to see that Jesus is equal with the Father, and this is a declaration, Jesus is Lord. Why does that matter? Well, in Antioch, Caesar is Lord politically and religiously, and Apollo and Artemis were religiously Lord. But these Christians, now both Jew and Greek, are declaring, no, actually, there's a greater king than Caesar, a greater king than Apollo, a greater king than Artemis. Jesus is Lord. Well, it got so big, it says in verse 22, the news of this reached the church in Jerusalem. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived, he saw what the grace of God had done. He was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas oh, went to Tarsus to look for Saul. So you've got non-Jewish people and Jewish people now following Jesus together in the same church for the first time. Up to this point, there's no mixed gatherings. This is the first one. And then there's just sort of this historic little side note, but it really matters. Barnabas takes a 300-kilometer journey to go find Saul. Saul, remember, who was involved in killing Stephen, who radically met Jesus? And he goes to find him because Jesus had said Saul's main job was going to help non-Jewish people, first and foremost, find the God of Israel through Jesus. And of course, this is so brilliant and strategic. You're like, why? Well, here's why. Barnabas' group in, in Cyprus, uh, came from Cyprus, and Saul is from Tarsus. 
Both Barnabas and Saul are Greek-speaking Jews. They both grew up in multicultural, pluralistic environments. Both as Orthodox Jews believe Jesus from Nazareth is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. So of course they're going to lead the first church that's mixed because they've lived in these environments. Well, it says when Barnabas found Saul, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught a great number of people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. A lot of you know this, but maybe some of you don't. Uh, we were always actually called followers of the way. Uh, we were not called Christians till this moment. Now, this is not a title we chose or wanted. It actually is from the voice or the people not, so, not from our movement. Uh, actually, most scholars believe it was an insult. Uh, Christian means little Christ. Little Christ, little Christ, like it was like a spinning thing at us. Interestingly, in the whole New Testament, it's only mentioned 200 times, once in Acts and once in the writing of Peter. Well, we're first called Christians in Antioch, and the church is growing. It's the first multicultural church in history. And then what's so incredible is the Holy Spirit keeps forming the church in another powerful way. The, the role of spiritual gifts becomes center. It says in Acts eleven twenty seven. 27, during this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, whose name was Agabus, stood up and through the Holy Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread through the entire Roman Empire. This happened during the reign of Claudius. Okay, I need to just take a pause for a moment. Everyone, wherever you are, in a kitchen, listening on a plane, or if you're in a physical location, just look up at the screen. We talk here all the time about spiritual gifts. We're going to talk about it in a minute near the end of this message. But... Here we see one specific gift. Agabus has the spiritual gift, the New Testament gift of prophecy. There's always confusion around this, so I'm just going to do a little mini moment so we catch this together. Here's the best definition that I found years ago that we use all the time. A person operating with the gift of prophecy has the capacity to deliver truth in a public way, either in a predictive nature, future, or as a situational word from God in order to correct by exhorting, edifying, consoling Christians, or to convince non-believers of God's truth. In other words, New Testament prophecy, someone is given something that's either this is going to happen in the future, or God wants to speak this right now in this moment. It's not the gift of teaching, by the way. Uh, let's just deal with some questions. Are those with the gift of prophecy in the New Testament the same as Old Testament prophets? A loud, huge no. In the Old Testament, prophets spoke and wrote the very words of God. They wrote the scriptures. We've talked about this in our spiritual gift series. In the New Testament, those that had that same authority had the office of capital A, apostle. It's the apostles in the New Testament, not small p prophets, that have had the authority to write God's word. So if you were a prophet in the Old Testament, you had to get everything 100% right, or you were false and you were stoned to death. So prophecy is not the same. In the New Testament, prophecy is when someone is given a word, an image, even a scripture given by the Holy Spirit in a public moment, either to speak to someone in that crowd or the whole community, or actually tell what's going to happen. But it does not need to be perfect. This is why Paul later said in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test them all. Hold on to what is good. One person wrote it like this. Paul implies that prophecies will contain some things that are good and some things that are not good when he commands them to hold to what is good. This is something that could never have been said of the words of the Old Testament prophets or the authoritative teachings of a New Testament apostle. In other words, Agabus, as an example, you need to test and sift what's from God. Agabus has the New Testament gift of prophecy. In this case, he speaks about the future, and by the way, it happened. During the reign of Claudius, in the 1st, 2nd, 4th, ninth, and 11th year, there were famines in Egypt, Rome, Greece, and Judea. So here's the summary. In Antioch, the church grew and grew and became one of the very first major centers of our faith. And if you've been coming to Sanctus for more than a year, you know that actually the church in Antioch has a special place for us. We have a very clear mission here. We have a very clear end goal vision here, but we also have what we call a cultural vision or what our desired flavor is, and it's actually based on the church in Antioch. This is what we want to feel like, look like, we want to be on the ground and continue to fight for.
So it says in Acts 13.1, in the church at Antioch, there were now prophets and teachers. Mm. Barnabas and Simon called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Mannion, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And I've preached this many times before. Let me do it again. I want you to see the revolutionary power of what the gospel has done. You've got Jews, Greeks, and Romans meeting together in the church for a year. Like, unheard of, shocking. And the list matters beyond Saul and Barnabas now being friends, which when you know the background just should be like, wow. Look at the rest of the list. You've got Simon called Niger, and this is a Latin title, Niger, because of his skin color. So he's African in origin. And Lucius is a very common Roman name, but he's from Cyrene. He's North African from Libya. And then you've got Mannion. This is always the one that blows my mind. He's the foster brother of Herod. Now, we just came out of Christmas, out of the Advent season. Herod, this is the Herod from the Christmas story. This is the one that the wise men talked to. This is the one who killed all the little children trying to kill Jesus. This is the one who would have John the Baptist beheaded. This is his foster brother. Basically, this is an old way of saying his best friend is now a follower of Jesus in the first multicultural church. The gospel always divides families. Trust me. So you got people from all backgrounds, Jews, both Hebraic speaking and Greek speaking, which is a big deal. And you've got non-Jews, African, North African, Roman, Greek, and the list goes on. God, through the work of Jesus, his son, and the presence of the Holy Spirit, brings people, those who would never be together politically, never be together socially, never be together religiously, are brought to the throne of God through the Holy Spirit to worship in spirit and truth. And this is what's going to be permanent in the new heavens and the new earth. That's why we fight for this now. Well, it says in Acts 13, 2, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit spoke. Set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. So a year later, stuff unexpectedly happens. Now the word worshiping, I've shared this before, has a real punch. This word in the Greek version of the Old Testament was almost exclusively used for the service of priests and Levites in the Jewish temple. So the gathering of Jewish people and non-Jewish people as Christians to fast, pray, to be taught, and to speak utterances of the Holy Spirit is equal, wow, is equal to the priestly worship of the living God in the Jewish temple. And by the way, at this moment, the Jewish temple still was functioning. This is scandalous. This is, this is, this is true though. So the Holy Spirit is in his temple, that is the church, the people of God, and he speaks. And through the gift of prophecy again, He tells, the Holy Spirit tells the community the will of Jesus, the head of the church. And in this moment, a year later it would seem, Jesus calls out Barnabas and Saul, the two most eminent and gifted leaders. And think about it, Barnabas, super pastor, encourager, like cheerleader, Paul, visionary, leader, theologian. You've got your two best thinkers, your two best preachers, your two most anointed. And during this amazing, oh my goodness, we want to all live here moment, the Holy Spirit says, you both need to leave. Now notice when the prompting happens, during the time of of prayer and fasting. So I'm just going to repeat this again and again and again. Spiritual gifts are the only ongoing guaranteed place of power to serve from because the Holy Spirit's with you. And spiritual practices become the ongoing place where we are transformed, where we're changed. They clear the ground. They provide the space so we hear, get permission, and keep in step with the Spirit. As Jesus, listen in, as Jesus was led exclusively by the Spirit to use spiritual gifts to minister and spiritual disciplines to listen, so local churches are called to be in the same place and the same posture as Jesus. This is what makes Sanctus a lot different from many other churches in the area, because this is not their starting point, but this is our starting point. In other words, let me put it like this as we start 2024. Antioch Antioch is our archetype, our flavor, our desired cultural vision, strong teaching, a place of influence for the kingdom in our own region and beyond, spiritual disciplines, mutual submission, strong leadership, growing in cultural diversity, all the spiritual gifts at the center of serving, sensitivity to the Spirit's leading, prompting that leads to good planning, the staying and going of leaders as the Holy Spirit commands and moves. This is the church that we want to be. This is the church God is calling us to be. This is our God-given flavor, rooted in God the Father's calling, 
rooted in the work of Jesus and rooted in the power of the Spirit. Okay, let me pause and let me walk through this a little bit. Number one, a few critical takeaways as we get ready to really live into 2024. And wow, it seems like it could be a really wild year. But no matter, Jesus is Lord. So number one, very important for someone or a group of people listening today. Did you catch it? God used unnamed people to do some of his greatest work. We have no clue who the people were that came from Cyrene and Cyprus. I mean, maybe it was that one guy from Cyrene, but we don't know, to establish this church. God uses unnamed people to do his greatest work all the time. You do not need a profound Christian platform. You do not need to be the most spiritually gifted person or naturally or acquired gifted person in the room. You do not need to be a known person to do the will of God. Remember, God, (laughs) this is so important, God in the end will honor and reward faithfulness over fame every single time. The vast majority are like, I'm not a Christian known person, doesn't matter, just be faithful. Continue to do the work of God and let him establish what he wants. Again, one day we're going to be in the new heavens and new earth. We're going to meet these people. We'll find out who they are. But they established one of the key centers of Christianity that still 2,000 years later is still having global impact. It's still functioning today. So one thing you might want to do as you start 2024 is simply say, if you're a Christian, as a Christian, no matter how much influence or platform or knowingness I have, I'm just going to be faithful. Lord, hear my prayer. That's an amazing, honest, good way to start 2024. Here's another thing, as things always are more complicated and, and, you know, difficult. I just want to remind all of us, if, if Christians could thrive in Antioch, then we're going to be just fine in Toronto. I mean, think about it. God moved and, and planted the first multicultural church in a city very similar to us pluralistic, multicultural, sexually diverse in multiple directions. Every religion on earth is there. Multiple nations are there. And it just thrived because God had ordained it. So I want to remind you as we start 2024, we live in the most multicultural city on earth. God has placed us here among many other churches. We have a profound opportunity. Yes, it's post-Christian. Yes, it's repaganizing. Yes, there's difficulty with pluralism and multicultural fragmentation and global... I know. But don't forget, God has placed us in this time, in this moment, to do His work. And if they thrive in Antioch, we can thrive here. Do not fear, the Lord is with us. Last thing, and we're going to slow down and just do this. If we're going to continue to become the church God has called us to be, we always need to stop and just evaluate where we all are personally. Because if we actually don't take a personal evaluation then we can't assess the health of our church to move forward. Because remember, how I live my life privately and publicly affects the holiness of this church, affects the presence of the Spirit in this church, His quenching or His welcome, it all matters. And so here, every year, once or twice a year, we take a moment and pause. And not only are we clear about our mission or our vision or our cultural vision, we also say, where am I in relation to Jesus and becoming more like Him? Because we can't become the Church of Antioch unless we know where we're at. So years and years ago in our church, we chose simple, five simple phrases that are based on the guaranteed places of encounter that we talk about all the time to evaluate where we are. And lots of you know this, and some of you don't. We talk about celebrating big and connecting small and walking with Jesus and sharing the work and engaging in mission. And interestingly, everything I'm about to say in the next few minutes is found all in Acts 11 and Acts 13. Celebrate big. We believe in celebrating God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit together in big gatherings. In the early movement of our church, we see people of 3,000, 5,000 gathering together. Uh, We rally, we love, we're drawn to larger gatherings where preaching and teaching and worship and prayer and giving and communion are done together. This is what we're called to do. Jesus was regularly calling people to large gatherings where two or three gather in Jesus' name. He is present. God inhabits the praises of his people. Communion's a guaranteed place of encounter. Baptism's a guaranteed place of encounter with spiritual gifts. We just make this a priority. So if you're right now in a gathering, uh, maybe at Ajax or Port Perry or Pickering or Bowmanville or online, 
You're celebrating big. This is a priority. The second one is connect small. In the early church, not only were they involved in big gatherings, they were involved in small gatherings. They did life together. They ate together. They shared together. They prayed together. They helped together. They had relationships with each other. We believe connecting small is just as important as celebrating big. The primary place where we connect small are connect groups, even though, of course, alpha and other expressions are the same. This is where someone notices your spiritual growth. When a tough thing happens, they're there. We pray together. We eat together. We learn God's word together. We support. We care. And again, why do we do it? Well, we're trying to imitate Jesus. And Jesus, yes, was among large crowds all the time and also hung out with 12 people his whole run. Third thing is what we call walking with Jesus. Uh, Sanctus, we can provide connect groups and teaching and worship and serving opportunities, but we can't force you to spend time alone with Jesus. We have to take personal responsibility for our own relationship with Christ. That's why we talk about spiritual disciplines like scripture reading or prayer or biblical meditation or solitude, guaranteed places of encounter between you and Jesus. The ongoing rhythm between you and Jesus is so key. When you regularly walk with Jesus, it's not always fire from heaven, right? But as you prioritize time in your day or week, you know Jesus is going to show up. He'll change your life in small and large ways. And we all need to walk with Jesus personally. And and why do we do this? Well, we're just imitating Jesus again, right? Jesus spent time with large crowds all the time. It was in worship services, by the way, in synagogue all the time. He hung out with 12 people all the time. And he was alone with the Father all the time. These these are, I mean, I don't mean 24-7. I just mean he regularly practiced these things. If we're going to become like him, and we're going to become the church of the Antioch, this is what we do. So you got celebrate big, you got connect small, you got walk with Jesus. Next one is share, share the work. We've talked about this in Acts 11 and 13. We believe that God has uniquely given every Christian at least one spiritual gift that advances the kingdom of God. Spiritual gifts, I'm going to say it again, is the guaranteed place to power to, of power to serve from because when you are working in that place, the Spirit of God is with you. The Spirit of God gives you these gifts, so there is joy that you will find here that's different than a natural or acquired gift. Burnout rates drop because you're accessing a well of power that's not you, and, and it's Spirit-driven. It also undoes comparison. I don't need to be you. You don't need to be me. Sharing the work is not independence or dependence, it's interdependence, working together with our gifts. And why do we do it? Well, because Jesus used spiritual gifts exclusively to do his ministry. And then the last one is engage in mission. And to make it quite simple, engaging in mission for us is we witness, we proclaim the gospel, and we give. We're called to take the gospel to our families, workplaces, and neighborhoods. We're also called and commanded to give our time and our money to invest in things that ripple into eternity. Generosity has always marked the early church and the followers of Jesus. Giving and sharing the good news is key. Now, don't misunderstand, of course, these dimensions or environments are not just some to-do list or checklist. They're designed to be a continuum where you can see how close or far you are from Jesus. This is about love, not duty. God loved us through Christ. We love Jesus so much, we want to be near Him, and we want to be in the environments where He is so we can be changed like Him. We want to hang out more in these places, and as we become more like Jesus, things like Antioch become much easier. And that's why we chose years ago this simple way to evaluate where we're at, an image or an idea. We we were looking for like an icon that basically you could have right on a napkin in 15 seconds or less, and you could just find out where you're at. So we're going to throw up the image here. And if you look at the image, this is a self-assessment, which, by the way, we're all going to do virtually or physically right now. And what you see, you have the center, and then you have these sort of spikes going out. Now, the goal is, and site pastors are going to now lead you, either online or actually in person, how to do this. But basically, on the self-assessment, you're going to draw a small circle along each one of the five dimensions that best represents how you feel you're personally doing right now, January 2024. The more active you are in one of those five areas, the farther from the center you should mark the circle. So you're the center, okay? And you've got the five dimensions. And so the better you're doing, the farther that should be out. The less active you are in that environment or dimension, the closer you should be. And as you sort of see your shape of where you're at, then, and site pastors will lead you, then there should be this moment 
where you decide what one or two dimensions you want to grow in this year so you can grow and do really well in that and then continue to become more like Jesus as we as a church, of course, want to become more and more like what God has called us to be in Antioch. So I'm going to say right now, site pastors are going to take over right now. They're going to lead you through this process. This is not only going to help you know your shape. This is going to allow us to know sort of where our church's shape is is at this moment, which is going to allow us to pastor better. And then we're going to take a moment sort of to do this and move forward. But before site pastors do this, I just want to take a moment to pray. I'm going to pray the Holy Spirit makes things clear to us. And also that we would become what we're called to be. So uh, before anyone gets up, let me just pray this. Lord, thanks for 2024. Uh, We give it to you now and we dedicate this year to you. No matter what happens in the world, with war or politics or natural disasters or successes or business or the economy, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And we're going to follow you. Number one, Lord, help us to be faithful and encourage people to be faithful. Just help us to truly be established and do what we're called to be. Number two, help us not to give in to fear. Help us to truly become and continue to become like that church in Antioch in all of its forms. And number three, would you now lead us so you, Holy Spirit, speak to us. You tell us where we are in these dimensions, and you speak to us and tell us where we should grow. We pray this in Jesus' name, hoping we'll be more like Jesus in 2024, personally, as in a church, and as a church. We pray this in the name of Christ. We all said? Okay, amen. Say, pastors, Uh, Lead your communities now.